Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Anahmaduhu wa nasalli ala rasulihi kareem amma ba'd. Uh, today, the scholar of economic thought, the Muslim scholar, is quite famous uh, Tunisian uh, scholar. I think most of us, we know him by the name of Ibn Khaldun. Uh, his full name uh, was uh, Abu Zaid Abdul Rahman Ibn Muhammad Ibn Khaldun Al Hadrami. So, this Al Hadrami is uh, something uh, to uh, talk about his uh, origin because, according to his own uh, uh, auto, uh, autobiography, so I think uh, it's not that difficult uh, to, you know, to know about the scholar when the scholar himself. Uh, write his own history, his own biography. I think uh, that's the that's 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 one good thing about this scholar. Uh, he wrote a book by the name of Ta'rif bi Ibn Khaldun wa Rihlatihi Gharban wa Sharqan. Huh? The name is uh, presenting Ibn Khaldun and his journey west and east. So, if you look at his own book, I think he wrote his uh, life, his education, his work, wherever that he um, traveled, you know, because uh, this is the beauty of uh, an history historian. Because we have seen so many historians in our life, we call Mu'ar, Mu'ar uh, sorry, uh, Mu'arrikhin, Tariq Mu'arrikhin. Like we have a fuqaha, muhaddithin, mufassirin, right? We also have a muakhirin, or those people, the one who wrote histories. So I think this is the one of the good thing about this particular historian, because he wrote his own uh, autobiography. So he talks about his own um, uh, Hadrami origin, uh, whereby he says that. Uh, of course, he is an Andalusian, is from Andalus, but he belonged to a family of Arab descent. That Arab descent, his ancestors was an Hadrami, the Hadrami by the name of, uh, uh, the Hadrami that goes and connect with uh, Wa'il ibn Hujr. This Wa'il ibn Hujr is actually one of the Prophet's companions. He is a Sahabi, eh, radiallahu anhu. So that's how he connects, and then they travel to Tunis long time ago, and then he happened to be uh, Spain. You know, he happens to he happens to be in so many other places, of course. Uh, so that's how his uh, family uh, starts. Uh, so his full name, as I told you earlier. Uh, can go to uh, Ibn Khaldun, in, and the name is Ibn, is, is his, his ancestor name is actually Khaldun. His original name is Abdurrahman. All right? All right then. So there are some other uh, uh, criticism on his own uh, biography as well. That's because uh, someone uh, got to know that uh, it is possible that um, Ibn Khaldun from uh, you know, from from a uh, Muladis. So this Muladis is actually one of the uh, Berber uh, family uh, descent. Uh, so so th uh, they also say is that's the reason why uh, Ibn Khaldun was uh, keen enough. Uh, he he wanted to write something about the Berberians. That's the reason why you can see that he allocated the last two chapters of his famous book, Kitab al-Ibar. If you look, we will talk about the book later. So, you know, uh, uh, he, 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 he allocated uh, two uh, big chapters talking about this Berber. Uh, so that's the reason why few, few uh, analysis is there that he could be from Berber, but there were some Arabs used to call them. There were some group of people used to call them like they wanted to become Arab. But that's not the case here. To me, I think he himself wrote in his own book. He says that he is Hadrami. So, so I think uh, that's, that's clear 
who who else can if he is wrong then he can be wrong but according to his writing we need to understand that he's also hadrami all right so i tell you why because this is all has a great impact on this particular scholar you know because this scholar he is not just a normal uh, or just just like everybody else because um he uh, you know he was a politician he was a historian he was a sociologist he was a economist right and uh, there are many words about uh, of course he, he exactly was born around 700 years ago uh, so it's 1332 so now it's 2021 going to be so almost uh, 700 years uh, you know uh, Uh, the, 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 there are so many uh, good things about this uh, great scholars scholar because you know this is the the, the the one i can show you right now is encyclopedia britannica talks about him and uh, it says that uh, you know he was um, um uh, 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 this they, they say that it's more than 1000 years between the times of the philosopher like aristotle uh you know in ancient greece or the writer of uh, hevely in renaissance italy and they said there is a one social scientist uh in the west of west was a muslim arab scholar named ibn khaldun right and also someone said uh, like uh, arnold toynbee he he said that you know in the in, in the prologimina muqaddima to his universal history Uh, they call this universal history because uh, the book name is kitab al ibar so al ibar if you want to you know if you want to translate i think the good translation will be universal history al ibar is actually normally uh, allah says uh, siru fil arli uh, you know you go around and see the world and then you will see understand you you you, you learn you will learn lessons that's the reason why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask you to go around it's not just for the fun not just like for the purpose of entertainment it is the purpose of learning something you go and you see people's place how they were living then you understand that okay these people lived here but what happened at the end uh, they 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 lived in this in this big big places of palaces but right now where are they so this is how you learn from the lessons so i think the word kitab al ibar i think it's a very unique word that uh, ibn khaldun he chose so by choosing the book name itself it shows that you know he was quite keen about what he is doing i think that the translation of al ibar into universal history i think i really like the translation so he says that um, like arnold says that um, Ibn Khaldun has conceived and formulated a philosophy of history which is undoubtedly the greatest of its kind that has ever yet been created by any mind in any time or place these are the great words you know so uh, so before i go into his work all right uh, so we will put it into three uh, you know three 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 uh, maybe like uh, three areas to cover let's talk about him first uh, his origin let's let's talk about him first and then we talk about his uh, his book and then we will talk about his economic thought most probably the economic thought i want to talk about it in, in the next class inshallah there are so many starting from labor to demand to price supply you know money he talks about occupations i don't know where to start where to end it's a lot by the way in fact i have right now uh, 56 slides of you know i want you to please go through and read i think it it will help you to understand the whole thing uh, in fact uh, it will also help you for the purpose of your exams and everything so um so here we have uh, okay ibn khaldun i think i told you about his a uh, name and his origin right and uh, he was quite famous for muqaddima right and also he wrote his own autobiography right um and he is very quite famous for 
you know, uh, history, historiography, sociology, economics, demography, political science. And uh, there are a couple of uh, notable ideas about Ibn Khaldun, from Ibn Khaldun. Uh, number one is, it's called cyclical theory of empires. It is called Asabiyya as well. Uh, also this this Asabiyya and then this cyclical theory of empires, I think it's a kind of theory I don't think anyone told earlier about this. You know, I, 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 I always uh, refer to this uh, theory, cyclical theory, you know, not, not, this is not necessarily has to be something to talk about economics. Uh, but according to, as a sociologist, you know, he actually talks about it, you know, there is a rise, there is a rise and there is a fall. So I see it like the, the, the very, the, the best uh, analogy, the best, um, what they call it, uh, the best uh, metaphor that he gives. He says, take a person, take a human, there is a rise. Uh, he is he was born he is he was a fetus and then he was born and then he grew grow and then he started to grow and then he started to crawl and then he started to grow again and then he started to stand and then he started to grow again walking and then running and then growing again becoming tall he is able to speak he is able to you know uh see everything understand everything the language he can understand there's language he can speak and then he goes again and he can take himself and then he can stay away from the fire he can stay away from the cold and then he can understand the warm uh, and then he goes back and then he goes to you know understanding the reality the universe and then he goes again he becomes like, you know, when he becomes like 33, 40, 45, 50, so he becomes the peak. He's at the peak of maturity, he can understand. Then what happens? This is what happens. After he reached the peakness of his life, he becomes the mature person. He can decide everything better and good. And then he is strong. He can do everything in his hand. Then what happens? Then he's slowly falling down, right? His eyesight's going down. His hands are not strong. He is bowing. Huh? He is actually difficult to stand up, sitting again. And then sitting also very, become, become very difficult, laying down and then crawling, you know, the things are going down. Now, this is a very simple metaphor. Everyone can understand. Anyone can say. Everybody knows this. But he used that metaphor into a nation, into a community, into a, 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 I mean, I mean, people's life, a society. In, into entire universe. So he says that a community will grow and it will go to peak. It will become the strong community, strong society. And then one day it will go down, it will fall down. And then the community will go away. Then the new community will come. The new uh, kaum, uh, the society will come and then they go up. This is not in the face of 60 years because the 60 years timeline is only for the human being. But when it comes to a community, then it might go for 100 and 100 and 100 years, maybe more than 1000 years, maybe. So he saw that inclination and declination. He saw that inflation and deflation, the growth and fall. Because at his time, everybody were looking history as a history and then they started noting down because all those historians, their job is to record the history. This is the first social scientist, Ibn Khaldun is the first person who analyzed the history. 
the one who read so many history who saw everything and then he started converting into ideas he says that it happens because of that it happens because of this it was like this it grow grow and grow and then people become populated i mean people grow and grow people population growth and then because of the population growth what are the things they got and after that what are the things came in because of the population because of so many luxury things came to life what happened after that how the community go down everything this is what he talks in asabiya you know uh, i like this idea that's because when he was able to do that in in his time 700 years ago and just think about the same idea al asabiya the cyclical theory of empires think about it what happened before him and what uh, what happened uh, what happened after him because before him he knows of course that's the reason why he was able to do kitab al ibar and uh, we also in this uh, particularly this class we talk about it like there were khulafa rashidin then there were umayyad then there were abbasid then so many others like you know fatimid hashimid uh he himself from uh, hafsid it's called haf hafsa hafsi hafsid so do so many then ottoman came later and then declined so someone was able to like for example like uh, there is a scholar like mustafa naima and uh, ahmed pasha was able to see used ibn khaldun's theory to analyze the growth and decline of the ottoman empire the user theory you want to use the theory for soviet russia please use it you will see that fall and decline and quite recently i saw someone wrote very good article i was enjoying reading it and he talks about uh, the current united states how the thing that right now we have how it was now how it is tomorrow what it will become forget about the countries go with companies go with institutes there is one there was an institute goes up and then it has to go down there was a company it has to go up it has to go down if you remember about nokia or any other companies how it was there was a time no one can challenge that kind of company and then they said okay we are on the top today we don't even know where is it right like the company like kodak huh <laughs> the, 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 if you know about the flames and everything how it was and how it is now so today just imagine the companies it could be i don't mind sharing this with you today the company like google could be uh, 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 an apple could be on the top okay whether you agree with me or you disagree with me is your personal opinion but what i is what i see it's not going to be forever because no one in this universe can be forever right so that is what the 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 real uh, the real success that we are talking because in this world there is no one single person can become that kind of success other than if it is for the sake of allah if it is for the sake of sharia if it is the sake of islam that's the reason why today we don't see any problem in the leadership of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the man right is a man was until today we see that there is nothing can beat him the rest all you can see so many problems with that man you can see so many things that with other people but that's why prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was uh masum huh? masum means that you know he, he 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 whatever the mistakes there is no mistakes on him everything that he was guided properly guided by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so with that note i would like to give you his idea of this cyclical theory today whatever that you think there's a possibility tomorrow it could change because this is my imagine this is my observation i can give you this when united states ask huawei to go out 
when sorry no offense to, to to us citizens in this class i think we have some us citizens you know when they uh, think when they thought you know uh, the huawei is making this making that the 5g and everything when when united states uh, ask china to stop sending this and then ask them there is there, of course there is still there is a thing going on who knows they are actually already started uh, digging their own grave <laughs> right because you cannot stop the country like china and you can see the things that the fast the the, the strength the efficiency they have in fact uh, uh, you know in in my observation i i, I saw once uh, the, the, the 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 interview given by um, tim cook the one, uh, the CEO of, of, of uh, Apple, and he said that, you know, the reason we go to China for uh, manufacturing is not because the manufacturing in China is cheap. It's not because the labor is cheap. It's because the efficiency. In US, you ask for a specialist in engineering and then they will be full of room. But you go to China and you ask for uh, engineering in one particular field, it will be full of football ground. <laughs> it will be full of football ground. So that's the efficiency that they have. So now I'm just giving you. So today, whoever you think is like the giants, you call it G8, G10, or G20, whatsoever, not necessary. We have the history, Soviet, you know, how it was, German, how it was. Today, where it is, today, who is strong? So these are the things I want you to understand the reality of the universe in the eyes of Ibn Khaldun. And that's how you see the book, and that will help you to understand more, the cyclical theory. Other than that, he also have economic growth theory. Inshallah, we will discuss about it probably next class. He also have the supply and demand theory. This is all his notable ideas, yeah? And uh, his education, mashallah, he was able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, with a proper education, I think, I don't think he will be able to, you know, achieve whatever he has achieved. And um, when we have to talk about uh, his uh, life, we can talk about like into three phases. The first phase, he was at, like maybe say 20, 20 years, maybe, I think around 70 plus, he was able to live around 70 plus, I think. Maybe in the first phase of his life is actually his um, education. You can talk about his education. And uh, even his uh, grandfather, great-great-grandfather also wrote few books, like Adab Al-Khatib, uh, some of the books like uh, Writing Finance, you know, Writing Scholarship and this kind of things. Even his father also was in, uh, politically was assigned by someone. So you can read all these. Uh, you know so many things about his uh, his 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 ancestors, right? He learned Arabic uh, from his father and also some others like uh, um, Muhammad ibn Arabi al Hussein. He studied tradition hadith from uh, Shamsuddin Muhammad bin Jabir, uh, and then he was also follower of Ibn Rushd, right? You know Ibn Rushd was Abu Ros. I think we don't have uh, Abu Ros here in our class because it's more into uh, not directly into economics but it is all related if you want to read Ibn Rushd you can go and read Ibn Sina also we don't have it in our class Al-Farabi uh, we don't have it in our class because those people are talk about knowledge science philosophy and everything but at the end of the day economics also philosophy right you need to understand it's also part of philosophy and then we have Al-Razi, we read about it. We read about him, mashallah. Uh, so he was the follower of all these uh, great scholars, right? All these, let's say, rationalist philosophers, right? And then um, uh, from 17 year, he was able to go schooling, could hardly be called. Yeah, there, there were some, some issues also. He has to travel to Tunis to other places. It's called Fez, Fez actually. He has to travel, then he has to come back to Tunis. But um, there were some clashes between Sultan, and then he was not able to stay in Tunis. So he went for Fez. 
he stayed there after 27, 20 years, then only he was able to come back to Tunis. So this is his first phase. In his second phase, after he finished studies and everything, so he was actually able to uh, be as appointed as a master signature for the Sultan, all right? And so many places as a secretary, he was, so you can see that he was, I think what I see, what uh, made Ibn Khaldun write a book like Kitab al ibar it's like uh, his position as a, as a so many, you know, wonderful uh, uh, administration he was. And then I think also, I think uh, he was able to read and observe from so many uh, historical collections. So you will get only those collections, uh, you will get access to those collections only if you are in proper positions. I think that's how uh, Ibn, Ibn Khaldun was able to learn so many things. So in his second phase, he was politically, he was actually uh, appointed by so many, uh, so many sultans, so many governors and everything. You can read all these one by one, yeah. The third phase is where actually, this is the last phase where he was able to uh, you know, produce books like Kitab al ibar he wrote a Muqaddimah in six months, um, you know, uh, sorry, five months, he was able to finish a Muqaddimah. Muqaddimah is actually uh, a part of uh, the first part of the book. I think we'll talk about it later, about Kitab al ibar yeah. Um, okay, so I think, uh, yes, he was also in 1378, um, there was again, you know, the, the, the problem with, um, clashes of uh, sultans and he was actually went to jail and then um, then he was able to come back to Tunis and then lived after that 26 years in Tunis then um, he was able to go to Egypt and then appointed as a lecturer of hadith so this is what actually is striking me because you see the last position he was actually before he died it was actually he was a muhaddith so now Whatever that today we are observing as Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Khaldun was a sociologist, was economist, was a political scientist, whatsoever. But we call it because, uh, because of his book, because of his uh, magnum opus, which is Kitab al ibar But he was a muhaddith. He was appointed as a muhaddis in Al Azhar University, right? He was also a faqih. So when he was living, he was a faqih and muhaddis, but he was able to produce uh, writings which supports the economic and political and uh, social aspects. So that's, I think, the, 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 the very important thing that I want you to note, right? And um, yeah, you can read all these things. So now let's go to his work. Yeah, this is the second thing we talk about. Then we're going to talk about his um, economic thought. All right, his work, actually, uh, speaking of his work, um, it's not many, <laughs> you see. Because usually uh, we will be thinking that, you know, uh, he wrote so many books, uh, hundreds of them, like you know, Imam Ghazali and others. It's not. Um, uh, he wrote a huge book. He wrote many pages, but very quality book. That's why, if you look at his book, you will even is in his own biography. He is actually not uh, talking about other other books that he wrote. He talks about only his own book, Kitab al ibar So now coming back to Kitab al ibar uh, let me start with the name. Because all of us, we know the name is Kitab al ibar but the full name is, it's a very huge and long name. Kitab al ibar wa Divan al-Mubtada wal-Khabar, fi tarikh al-Arab wal-Barbar, wa man asaruhum, wa man asaruhum min, min, min zavi sha'an al-Akbar. So this is the great book name, you know. The thing is Book of Evidence or maybe you can say universal history, record of beginnings and events, you know, Kitab al Diwan al Mubtada wal Khabar. I think people who knows about Arabic uh, grammar, I think uh, you know the word Mubtada and Khabar stands for what? 
Mubtada is actually like a subject and object. So here he brought he brings that word Mubtada Khabar as records of the beginning and events from the days of Arabs, uh, Persians, and also Berbers, and their power contemporaries. Uh, so uh, these are the lessons uh, record of beginning and event history of the Arabs and the Berbers and the powerful contemporaries. So now the book contains seven chapters. Yeah. The last two chapters talks about the ch chapter number six and chapter number seven. It's dedicated for the history, histori historiography of Berbers and uh, Morocco, Maghrib. Um, you know, uh, that's because uh, this is the reason why some of them still think that uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun might not be an Arab, he might be a Berber. That's the reason why he gave so much about uh, the, the history of Berber by synthesizing multiple, sometimes even contradictory sources about it. Uh, so um, this is the book number six and seven. The book number two, three, four, five, uh, the four chapters dedicated for, this is the big chapters, yeah? Two, three, four, five. It dedicated for the entire world history, which means that the, the time starts from the, 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 the history of the time which started as human humanly started yeah that's the, the one humanly humanly observed from that time until ibn khaldun time so now you can see that he wrote about everything everybody which is not that easy it's like you know today you have to apply for at least uh, at least a hundred million uh, us dollars grant to, to do that kind of uh, work because so many information that he mentioned he talks about he talks about Chinese he talks about Indians he talks about you know the, the, the travelings and also he talks about how people do trading how people do transactions and everything right everything he talks about it and the, the, the thing that as I told you earlier he didn't just record the history he observed and then he he convert into ideas so that's what about his world history yeah so um, uh, so uh, uh, so now my question is um, we had Ibn Khaldun uh, which happened to be like 700 years ago so let's say he wrote about 2000 years of history whatever that before 700 and then you 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 add another maybe 1300 or maybe he talks about even before the uh, before the um, uh, Arab, before the advent of uh, Jesus uh, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam it means it means that it might go to, up to Adam alayhi salatu wasalam so but he stopped 1300 because that is the time Ibn Khaldun lived of course Ibn Khaldun will not be able to write something future because there is no futuristic studies that time but the question here is do we have or why we didn't have another Ibn Khaldun after Ibn Khaldun do we have an Ibn Khaldun today in 2020 who can actually observe and write like Ibn Khaldun did. See, this is this is what I personally, you know, uh, observe that you know uh, we don't have that kind of scholarship anymore. We don't have that kind of scholars anymore. We don't have the dedication like that anymore. We all became like you know. Uh, okay, I am the I am a person. I am a specialist in this. I just do my job and then I go. I am a man. I am a family man, so I have to take care of my family. I go. I earn. I spend. That's it. So this observation, like a person can do this kind of observation. So that kind of person is not here. So that's the reason why. We need more Ibn Khaldun to come so that at least the remaining 700 years 
starting from 1300 until 2020, someone can write like Ibn Khaldun, observing everything and then give us, then it will be complete to do the study, right? Okay, so that's um, giving you the book number two until five. Then finally, let me introduce you, tell you the book number one, which is actually Al Muqaddimah. So normally, Al Muqaddimah uh, is actually called Introduction in Arabic or Prolegumena. You can say that. So it's a, like a preface to any work. So now um, he says, in order to the reason why Al Muqaddimah he wrote Al Muqaddimah. Because the in in, in Muqaddima is actually a preface, by the way. The book is the book number one is the preface for book number two until seven. Meaning to say, in order to understand the world history, starting from book two until including Berber until seven, you have to learn and understand the muqaddimah the preface it's like you understand the manual you read the manual before you start the engine so i think this is a great uh, methodology that you know uh, ibn khaldun brought like, like right now it's it, it is how we do right so we always give the manual understand it first before you do anything all right, so you come to the university, we give you the, the student guide. If any staff come, they get a staff guide. So we need to read the rules and regulations. How do we understand things? In every semester, the first class will be the introduction class. Now, right now, you have so many subjects even called uh, introduction to political science, introduction to uh, psychology, introduction to communication, isn't it? Engineering, for example. So. He says, this is the Muqaddima that you need to understand this. And then you go to world history, then you will be able to see the truth. So that's the reason why in his entire Muqaddima, he didn't give the references. Because you need to find the references in book number two to five. So Muqaddima is all about socio-economic, geographical, universal, history of empires and this is the best known of his work it's called muqaddima by the way muqaddima is not a book not a separate book like last time when i talked to you about imam shatibi i told you he wrote maqasid but maqasid it is not a it is not a separate work by imam shatibi it is the work from al muwafaqat so there is one chapter dedicated to Maqasid. So now, this is the book named Kitab al aibar It's a long name, but we short it. A uh, short vers version is actually Kitab al aibar Then the first book is actually al muqaddima which is actually the preface of the entire history, the world history, right? So the, 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 the muqaddima is actually giving you so many things because it gives you uh, the analysis of entire thing. I, I really like that uh, kind of uh, approach. It's like, you know, um, for example, when I ask you to do the tone paper, uh, some of you already asked me, even messaged me, I really like it. You, are, you wanted to know what should I write in summary? What should I write in abstract? So this is what you do. Al Muqaddimah is actually the abstract of his entire work. In fact, uh, today, uh, when we do any uh, research, for example, you happen if you happen to do master's degree or a PhD, then you have to even 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 today, even in your own assessment, uh, your term papers, you will be giving a, a a part. We call it analysis, or we call it discussion before the conclusion. All right. Usually, this is the format of the work. It will be like introduction then you have uh, the literature review then you have a methodology then you will have your analysis your findings and then based on the findings your analysis and discussion then your conclusion so the part before the conclusion is actually always important always uh, is also vital it is it is it is the most uh, difficult part to do 
but that is what actually needed because the rest everything is everywhere only the last part before the conclusion is what actually you are going to produce as an academic that's why it is called a thesis or it is called academic work if you look into any journal i think you have seen many journals uh, articles for example the last um, part the last section before the conclusion is actually what the author was able to extract and come with his own analysis so now coming back to muqaddima ibn khaldun's he put everything on his own analysis of entire human history in muqaddima that's the reason why it became very famous so concerning uh, the discipline of sociology um, he also described the dichotomy you know the 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 the, the, the power uh, about the warriors and conquering city you know um, so many things you can call it as a sociological work uh, whereby you can see that like the central concept of sabia like i told you just now or you can say social cohesions or maybe you can say uh, group solidarity or tribalism huh? at the same time you can also see uh, so many uh, political governing ideas and also you can see uh, many many economic ideas yeah or you can call it like a political economy if you want to say uh, it's like a value adding processes um so there are so many things like that uh, that's how uh, 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 that's that's the most important work about ibn khaldun which is uh, kitab al ibar then his own autobiography as i told you kitab al ta'rif all right um here you can see that he never mentioned any other book in his tarif um but he also there is there was there, there was one uh, work he mentioned like i i, I told you I, I, there is in in slide it's called um, describing about the north africa which is actually today is actually tunis misur and everything uh, he wrote in 12 small books for tamerlan i think great uh, it is he was a conqueror in 1401 uh, but he ordered to be translated in mongolian languages there's one there is there is one but we don't have the copies Okay, so now uh, if you want to know, talk about his uh, factors that shaped his mind, I think uh, here you have uh, so many factors uh, shape his mind. As I told you earlier, he was in great position. He had uh, access to so many uh, repository and knowledge, you know, starting from Greeks, Mu'tazila, Ashariya, Zahiriya, Ikhwan, Safa, Sufi, and philosophers. All right he was also had teachers like you know who taught him revolutions and also reasons yeah the influence of his own family right the the, the, the time and everything made him shaped his mind right so i think uh, this one i told you just now the prolegomena right the part of uh, muqaddima that you need to uh, you can see here uh, it talks about all those yes please all right then um okay from here i think we can start talking about his um, uh, economic ideas i think i have so many inshallah i will be uh, covering this inshallah very soon in our next class maybe i can start with few things probably you know we can catch up later the other things uh, let me just give you about uh, what he says uh, about labor and value because what i see fascinating uh, that you know uh, under uh, uh, there are many works actually has been done i think you you came across when you type ibn khaldun i think you will see so many works so many articles even uh, you will see that there are there were many conferences uh, happened in the past history in the name of ibn khaldun meaning uh, let's say 50 people they come and they they, they, they present only the ibn khaldun's work uh, so that's really fascinating the the, the thing that uh, myself i found is quite interesting that you know you can e easily read his translation you can just take uh, muqaddima um, in english and then you start reading it will make sense i tell you it's not like uh, 
this is what the quite interesting part. It's not like the classical um, jurist style. It is not like a classical Mufassirin uh, commentator style. It's not like that. It is uh, like, you know, um, it's like a philosophy and also wisdom. Like, for example, if you want to call something today economic wisdom, I think you can, you just read his work, I think you will clearly understand. It's not, it's, it's nothing about, it's even, you don't, I don't even need to explain to you. Let's say, let, let's see, I just read one of his writing, okay? He says that uh, God created for man all that is in the world. And the men possesses possess in partnership everything in the world. Once, however, an individual possess anything, no other person may appropriate it. Unless, unless he gives an equal value in exchange for it. Hence, once a man has acquired sufficient strength he tries to earn an income in order to exchange it for the necessities of life you see it's quite simple and easy to understand because this is all the outcome of the result and uh, and someone was able to do this 700 years ago uh, see the other thing I, I tell you the, he talks about the labor and value uh, this is the first topic that i wanted to give it to you then i'll go to this theory of man and society and everything and uh, he talks about the labor and value he says um the true of i mean uh, the income derived from minerals agriculture animal husbandry for without labor there would have been no produce or profit right the value of the labor is greater because labor plays in these crafts the dominant part i don't think that uh, that the fuqaha that we know earlier like you know that by the time of uh, yusuf abu hanifa maliki i don't think that the fuqaha they they have much to say about the labor uh, today mashallah we have a field called a labor economy am i right and uh, mashallah we have uh, we have some uh, some some expertise like uh, dr nahar and everybody you know who can give lecture in labor economy i think th these are the things uh, you know uh, uh, 700 years ago uh, ibn khaldun was able to do it yes he, he also says in occupations other than crafts the value of labor must be added to the cost of the produce for without labor, there would have been no produce. Mashallah. This is very simple and easy to understand. And everything looked like a theory to him. And today, we, you know, today people get Nobel Prize if, if, they get, if they get to create a theory. I don't know how many theories that he has in his book. When he talks about demand, he says that... Um, uh, when a craft is the object of demand, when a craft, a skill, become the object of demand, attracting much expenditures, it becomes like a commodity. See how deep it is. When you have the craft, the skill, and it's attracting much expenditure, and it has to, you know, uh, it has to come after uh, many expenditures to, to to make you like like a training part to make you an expert the expertise become what commodity that commodity can be used in exchange in fact you know he was also able to get uh, uh, the, the rightful mind of the scholars before him in fact um, uh, you know uh, you 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 know, this is what actually we have to be open and see. Um, it, it's all because of Quran and Sunnah. There is no doubt. Every good thing that we talk about, every good thing that we explain through these uh, courses or whatsoever, is all because of the, 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 the plantation that has been done to us. Uh, the, the the farming that has been done 
to our field, then it's now it's becoming like a crops, right? Because it is all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he has given us, the hikmah, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa brought, and then he taught us, yu'allimuhum, wa yuzakihim. So this is what uh, every prophet do. And because of that, the knowledge can be expanded and then goes to the next level. When someone said, for example, when someone said, um, like last class, if you remember, we talked about one, one saying uh, that was given by, actually, uh, we thought it, is, it, it was a hadith, but it came, it, 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 it came to my mind and I searched, I thought, then the, the word is actually not belong to Prophet Sallallahu it is belong to a, a companion. The statement is that the last time we discussed about it, we said Adunya Hisabuha Adunya Halaluha Hisabun wa Haramuha Azab. This is the world, whatever is halal is actually audited, should be audited. It comes under the account. Whatever is actually haram, it will be punished. It will be given punishment, or you know, it will be given you know so so this statement is actually didn't come from the prophet sallam. it came from hazrat ali radiallahu anhu right so now if you and me only uh, looking for uh, quran and sunnah there is nothing wrong looking into quran and sunnah but should i stop only in quran and sunnah should i also go and expand my search like Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu, right? Why Hazrat Ali was able to give that wisdom is because he learned the things from Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was able to get the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa taala, right? That's how we have to see the knowledge. We cannot, you know, put ourselves. Uh, in in a position that you know no I don't want to learn anything other than this I mean I'm talking about the uh, the, the religious uh, you know the religious the students the one who, who who learn Islamic studies and all now when Prophet ﷺ said this this is the real meaning because Prophet said whatever you learn from me you go out or you preach so that someone may come later can understand more than you can explain more than you, can do better than you. That's what happened, right? That's the reason why I was quoting to you like last time I discussed. Today also I'm going to quote another thing from Hazrat Ali, uh, from Ali And uh, in Muqaddimah, uh, Ibn Khaldun quoting this from Ali. He says, Hazrat Ali said, the worth of every man, the worth of every man, lies in his skill see how beautiful it is so now the muhaddisin can come and argue that you know whether the hadith is right or not whether this is hadith or maybe this is marfu or maybe this is mawquf there is a terms like because i'm also coming from hadith school uh, so I know that about they talk about marfu means it goes to Prophet Sallallahu means it goes to only Sahabi. But to me, where did Sahabi learn all this? Maybe the Sahabi didn't mention the Prophet name, but there is no other way that they learn, right? There is no other Prophet to learn. So that's why we need to look into Torah and everything together. It's all interconnected. And I think Ibn Khaldun was able to do it so because he was able to. He was a muhaddis. Remember, I told you? He was a muhaddis as well. But you will not see in his muqaddima that he is referring to, most of the time, he is, he is not referring to hadith in his muqaddima. Because in muqaddima is an outcome of the result. Right? So, some places he is referring to what Hazrat Ali said the worth of every man lies in his skill. This is quite fascinating for me to understand that, you know. Also, he talks about supply. Uh, we talked about demand. He also talked about supply. The supply, he says that the cost of agricultural production, the cost of agricultural production also affects 
the value of foodstuff and determines their price. And he talks about uh, the Andalusia for the case, as a, as a case study. He says, in Andalusia, uh, because of the Christians, they came and they took the land. What happened when Muslims came to Andalusia, they were able to uh, go away from the cities. Which means, uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun talks about the surface of the land. There are some lands or, you know, like quite normal lands, like, for example, like Kuala Lumpur. There are some lands like, you know, places like in, in, in Cameroon or maybe in Genting Highland, you know, those are the places like it's not actually, it's a hills. So he talks about it. He says the Christians, they take themselves for the fertile lands. But the Muslim, they happen to go to the coastal, like, you know, the coastal seaside, or maybe they have to go to the hill, the hilly regions, the hills regions. Now, he talks about the cost of agriculture in fertile lands and the cost of the agriculture in hill, hilly regions. Now, you know, if you happen to be in Cameroon, then you see how difficult is it in that land to make the tea to make the vegetables. I think most of the vegetables coming from there, but it's the taste, the quality. You won't get it. And if you happen to be in Cameroon, I enjoy go there, have a cup of tea, you know, sitting there in a place, enjoying the view and have, I don't know, maybe some of you went there, maybe some of you didn't, but if you didn't, please go enjoy the moment. Have a cup of tea in Cameroon Highland, watching the nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created and have that tea, you will, is, is every cent is actually worth of it to do that. Uh, so Imam Ibn Khaldun talks about it. He says that Muslims were living, living in that kind of places and they had to spend more cost for the agricultural production. And because of that, the, 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 the agricultural product went high in Andalus, not because of the scarcity. He talks about it. Usually, when we talk about supply and demand, they say, okay, the, 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 when you talk about supply and demand, they will say, okay, why the price is higher? The price is higher because of the scarcity, right? That's the one word answer. He says, it's not because of that. It's because of Muslims were hardworking. Muslims were working harder than the Christians and they were hard working because of that their quality was very good and since they were putting too much cost to the agricultural product then the price become higher see how nicely things he put yeah okay then so with that note I will end my class today so inshallah we will be continuing continue uh, we will continue our class uh, in the next class we talk about his price and the interdependence of the price the wealth the money the occupations the social impact and everything inshallah all right so i i finish here and i open the floor for any questions if you have any questions you can ask or please give me your um you can give me your observation, your feedback. What do you think about Imam Ibn Khaldun? What do you, have you read about him? Please uh, come forward. We still have 15 minutes.